Okay, now to the main act. Kevin, our man, is sold out uh, today, uh, which is terrific. Yeah, but I was, as I was told by somebody, no surprise, everybody loves Kevin. Um, he says he was a volunteer here from 2010 to 2019, and he was recently Turn for an encore performance. Uh, in the meantime, he received his master's degree from Harvard uh, in museum studies, so he's teaching me a thing or two, and he's not the wrist, so I can tell you a few times. Uh, but there's no question that his knowledge and expertise on um, all things to do with the report and uh, maritime history here is just absolutely fantastic. And Kevin, I want to say uh, uh, this is going off script and off bio, which uh, have to do. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure working with you, and thanks for bringing such a high level of uh, knowledge and competency uh, to our museum, and you're going to bring us to great heights. So perhaps with that, no further ado, please welcome great friend, Gavin. <laughs> January of 2019, believe it or not. Wow. So it's been a long time. You probably have forgotten what I do, and I hope I'm okay up here with you guys tonight. So. We're going to talk tonight about one of the items that is on display in the newly redesigned Mark I Gallery, which covers roughly the first 50 years of New Report's history, uh, which would also cover the time of the American Revolution. And that happens to be what this journal touches on. It's a journal from Dr. Samuel Smith. He was a surgeon on the privateer Dalton. And uh, as it says there, late of Mill Prison, which I'll talk a little bit about. But before we get into Samuel Smith, James wanted to make sure that I talked about <clears throat> the coffin stream assemblage. So this is a collection of indigenous artifacts that we were lucky to acquire recently. Uh, the story of this is starts with the Basante family in West Newberry, back around, you know, just before and around the turn of the last century. Uh, they lived along Coffin Stream, where Coffin Street and River Road are, and over decades, as they sort of dug um, it was an apple, the, the fellow that was running the place over there was an apple orchard, but they also had, my understanding, was like a kitchen garden. And as they would turn over the soil every year, they would come up with a few native artifacts and they kept them all together. And uh, the collection uh, was acquired sometime in, whoops, in, I don't know, probably the mid, maybe the 1940s, 50s, 60s, something like that, by a fellow named Maurice Burnham. He was born in Newbury Forge in 1940. Uh, he served in the National Guard, he ran the family's oil business, Burnham Oil, in West Newbury for over 20 years. And I guess he was something of a collector and he managed to acquire what is referred to as the Coffin Stream Assemblage, meaning all of these artifacts that came out of the ground in West Newbury, in, in one location. Uh, in 1995, when he retired, he moved, uh, I think, a little further north in New Hampshire, maybe even to Maine, and he, at the time he uh, gifted that artifact established to a small museum in Liberty, Maine, uh, the Davistown Museum. And that stuff has been up there pretty much ever since until about, I don't know, three or four weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> I reached out to Davistown Museum last year uh, on James's suggestion when he pointed out, you know, he came in as a new director and asked, is there anything in our collection that you know, is, has to do with Native Americans or indigenous people. And I said, well, yes, here it is. This is it. This is all we had in the collection. It was like one alley head <laughs> and, a, and a little piece of a pendant. That's it. That was the collection. So uh, I wanted to borrow a few pieces. And when I contacted them, they told me that the fellow who ran that museum had passed away in 2021. <laughs> And they were in the process of sort of trying to liquidate everything. So I said, well, if 
if you're willing, we're, we would love to have that stuff back in the Dewberries. And, uh, you know, one thing led to another, and so I drove up to Liberty, Maine. It's a long drive. <laughs> and it's in the middle of nowhere. And I picked up the artifacts about, I don't know, a month ago. And um, if you haven't seen them, they're downstairs in our first gallery when you come in, the Timeline Gallery, but I will talk very little bit about them. Just generally speaking, in case you're not familiar with, like, sort of the indigenous, and this is very general, and I'm no expert, so you know, forgive me, but um, uh, coastal Essex County, this area, <coughs> was first occupied by maritime archaic people from sort of the Gulf of St. Lawrence area. They kind of moved in as the ice started to recede and it became a little more bearable to be able to live in the area. So that was about 6,000 to 1,000 BC. So, you know, as much as 8,000 years ago. The next wave of occupation was by a maritime woodland people. Uh, they were from sort of the Great Lakes area, the Ottawa Valley area, and that was between 1000 BC and about 1000 AD. Um, they became part of the culture of the Gulf of Maine, which is why the Museum of Maine had been interested in this stuff on some level. And then finally between, say, about 11, 1200, 1300 AD, and you know, up until 1700 when there were European settlers here. There were Penacook bands that came into the area from the lower Merrimack Valley in New Hampshire. And their migration coincided with the onset of the Little Ice Age, which made gathering and horticulture and anything else a little more difficult at higher latitudes in the Northeast. And that those were the people that were here when European settlers came to the area. Here is some example pieces, and you can see these downstairs on the way out tonight. <clears throat> but the oldest piece in the collection dates from about 6,000 to about 4,000 BC. It's that Neville or Stark point, the projectile there at the top. Uh, it, I think it's probably the lower end of that, so maybe like about 4,000 BC. And then there's a lot of examples from 4,000 to about 1,000 BC that you can see there. Um, there's things like the very first thing there is a fishing weight, a plummet. It's a, you know it's for a fishing net or fishing line to, to weight it down. There's a full and a quarter channel gouge. There's that small white little projectile point. It's a squid knocket point. It's, it tells you sort of what year it was. There's scrapers, which is that little thumbnail looking thing, the third thing, and then. Uh, a sizable knife, which is the last item. That's a sharp edge on the bottom. You can hold it and you know cut, scrape. Then the early and middle woodland periods are actually represented in the collection by. There's actually two very small ceramic pieces. <clears throat> um, they're not in the picture here because they really don't look like much of anything, but. One is impressed with decoration from probably some kind of rope or fiber or something, so one has an impressed decoration on it. There's several what they call contracting stem points, which is that little group behind me here, and then an orient fishtail point, which is sort of diagnostic of that time, and that is the one that looks like a fish, obviously. And then finally, the late woodland ceramic period features, among other items, these two sort of very beautiful uh, Projectile points. One is side notched and one is corner notched. They're really, they're really lovely just to look at as artifacts. But so, you know, after the lecture and on the way out, make sure you stop in downstairs at the uh, the old customs collectors gallery. I think it's Brown Gallery now. So what we we move signs around and change some things. <laughs> on. But yeah. So uh, and of course, every as James said, we're planning for everything to be sort of officially reopened again. All the galleries by May twenty fourth. So we were lucky to get these things, I think. All right, back to Dr. Samuel Smith. So, the last time I presented, if you remember, I was talking about a Japanese woodblock carving uh, fellow, Hiroshi Yoshida, I don't know who remembers that lecture, but he did six woodblock prints of sailing ships that are all slightly different because they're supposed to show you the same scene at different times of the day. I'm happy to say that in our ongoing uh, redo of the gallery across the way, or the Bushy Gallery, those 
prints will be on display again, so you'll be able to see them. They're really terrific. And I'm talking about what's on display now in the Marquand Gallery, which is this very small journal. So I talked about this a little bit. Um, we're going to stretch out the timeline for the first 50 years. You can see when New Report Incorporated, of course, in 1764, it's a pretty small area, covered like 670 square miles. The population of the town at the time was like 2,800. Um, and then, of course, its first 25 years were pretty defined by the Revolutionary War. The entire town's fortunes changed, of course, after the 1800 time frame when you know, there was the fire, there was a recession, and there was an embargo, and, and you know, a long slide for a break, but we don't need to get into that. This little document in the collection, it's a four-page, single-sheet journal kept by Samuel Smith from May through December of 1777. And on its own, this little document doesn't say a lot, but this is the kind of little things I like to research because there's a few brief entries over seven months, but it really provides a lot of jumping off points to be able to tell a broader story, which I hope you'll enjoy. Samuel Smith was born in Ipswich in 1751 to uh, Captain John and Hannah Treadwell Smith. He was the youngest of 12 children. Uh, his father, Captain John, was fairly well off. The probate records indicate that he had a 100-acre farm, he had marshland, he had upland, he had a big house, two barns, I mean, you know, uh, half ownership in a wharf and a storehouse. And he actually had half interest in Grape Island, um, on the switch there. He sent Samuel to Harvard College, and while at Harvard, Samuel became a founding member of you know, one of those weird Harvard associations. It was called the Marty Mercurian Society. <laughs> and it was a military company, so-called, that was first established among public-spirited Harvard students in 1770 in the run-up to the revolution. He's listed as a fourth sergeant in that society. He graduated in 1772 as a physician, and I believe he initially set his practice up in Hampton, New York. As early as November of 1775, of course, Newburyport was building and fitting out privateers. I think everybody here probably knows privateers are privately held vessels that were used against the English during the Revolution. You, if you were a privateer captain, you carried a letter of mark, which marked you as something other than a regular just pirate that you could be hung on site for, basically. It was a document that explained that you were working on behalf of the government and hopefully that would keep you from being hung on the spot. And of course, many of the young men here in Newburyport, you know, signed on to these privateers because the risk was you capture an English vessel, you keep basically the ship's crew kept half of the value and the other half went to the, to the government. So, but of course, if, you, if your ship was captured, you lost it. Um, in 1776, Samuel Smith joined the crew of a newly fitted privateer called the Dalton that shipped out of Newburyport. He was the ship's surgeon, which is not surprising since he's a doctor. And the Dalton was named for one of the two principal owners. Stephen Hooper was one, and of course Tristram Dalton was the other owner of Dalton. The, the ship was 160 tons. It was commissioned on October 7th of 1776, and it was under the command of Elizar Johnson, Jr. It was listed with 18 guns and a crew of 120 people. They sailed from Newburyport to Portsmouth, New Hampshire on November 15th, and then on the 26th, they were bound for Europe. They went to sea. So the image behind me is not the Dalton. It's actually the Vengeance, which is probably an extremely similar ship. It was probably built almost exactly the same way here in town. The Vengeance was commanded by Wingate Newman um, on a single cruise out of Newburyport between June of 1778, May of 79, the Vengeance actually managed to capture uh, a British packet ship. They captured two British frigates. They captured two British privateers. I mean, it was they, they had a pretty good run. And uh, Vengeance eventually was commandeered for the Massachusetts Navy, probably partially based on its record. And unfortunately, it was sailed as part of the Penobscot expedition, which was 
extremely ill-fated and like every other ship in the Penobscot ex uh, expedition, it was burned to the waterline to prevent capture by the British. So. Mm -hmm. Dalton was not as successful on her first cruise, unfortunately, as Vengeance was. She didn't capture any ships. And in fact, on Christmas Eve, 1776, about 70 miles off the northwest coast of Spain, the Dalton sighted a ship which turned out to be HMS Raisinab. It was a 64-gun, third-grade British ship, so they were outgunned more than three to one. Uh, Elazar Johnson struck the colors, as they say, he surrendered immediately to British Captain Fitzherbert, very British. The crew was brought aboard Raisinab, where they were robbed of their clothing, and then they were thrown into the chain locker, which was uh, at the bow of the ship where they kept extra rigging and chains, anchor chains, and that kind of thing. Uh, the ship continued on to Plymouth, England, and um, they divided the crew between a coastal hospital, if they needed medical attention, and uh, a prison ship. And I don't know if you, during the revolution, they, had, they kept prisoners aboard ships in the middle of the rivers, basically over there as another sort of lair so that they wouldn't be able to escape. And they called them prison ships, but really they were sort of abandoned hulks so they, you know, these guys were put aboard this prison ship, which was kind of a hulk, it was the HMS Blenheim. And then they were there for the next six months. So the journal in our possession finally begins with an entry on May uh, 1777. And the, the entry notes from Samuel Smith, Brother Josiah obtained his liberty in consequence of petitioning. So he actually is speaking of his actual brother. He has a brother named Josiah. Uh, who was also a physician, oops, and um, had been surgeon aboard a ship called Montgomery that had sailed from Newburyport, carrying masts and spars uh, to France. The Montgomery was captured March 14th, and on May 9th, Brother Josiah obtained his freedom because he convinced the English prison board that he simply was a passenger aboard the ship. You know, nothing else. So they, they gave him his freedom, and he was given permission to briefly visit his brother who was aboard that prison hulk uh, before leaving the country. The next entry is dated June 2nd and notes that uh, we were committed to mill prison in Plymouth. That's the, that's the entry. This matches exactly with parliamentary records of the English House of Lords between June 2nd and June 11th. Uh, groups of the crew from the Dalton were taken ashore from the Blenheim and they heard judgment pronounced against them from a British Admiralty Court that had set up, you know, a temporary space in some tavern somewhere near there in Plymouth. And uh, he heard the following pronouncement against him, Samuel, you know, to the constables of the parish, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, by warrant under his sign manual called Old Mill Prison in Plymouth, said Samuel Smith was taken at sea in the act of high treason and committed on the high seas. And then he was then marched to the prison under guard. This is Mill Prison. It was uh, built in the mid 18th century and it, was, it became notorious for its treatment of American prisoners during the Revolution. In fact, um, Smith had two crewmates who kept diaries that detailed better than he did what was going on in the prison. Uh, so, from one of the crewmen, Samuel Cutler, we hear that, for example, we're not allowed to have pens, ink, paper, rope, candles, like nothing. No person's allowed to come into the outer yard to speak with us. We have no communication with anybody except Mr. Cowdery, the prison keeper. He's as great a tyrant as any in England, and he uses us with the greatest severity. Our allowance is, no, I didn't think this was so bad, but maybe you do. Our allowance is three quarters of a pound of beef, a pound of bread, a quart of very ordinary beer, and a few greens every 24 hours. <laughs> I he, he knows when, you know, when the beef, when boiled, only weighs about six ounces. So that's their daily allowance, except Saturday when they changed out the beef for cheese, apparently. So six ounces of cheese. To sleep, we have a hammock, a straw bed, and one very thin rug. Another one of the people that was in the prison with him, Charles Herbert, he notes the jail keeper was very strict. For example, there was a day when there was pleasant weather, as he notes, but we were all kept inside as punishment for misspoken words of the sentry on guard. So, as noted on July 13th, luckily for Samuel Smith, he, as it says, made my escape from prison, and he lists with Mr. Francis Little, Henry Lunt from Newbury, and three others. 
Samuel Cutler's diary again provides some more information. He notes on July 13th, this morning between the hours of 3 and 4 o'clock, Mr. George, who was confined in the black hole, which I don't know what that was in no prison, but it could have been that night. Nice. Henry Lunt, who was in the Itchy Prison, which is a separate building for prisoners who had mange. <laughs> Dr. Smith, Francis Little, and two others from the hospital made their escape through a vault drain. So, that couldn't have been pleasant either. Now, for all those guys that escaped, six of them, uh, the same night, July 13th, Mr. George was brought back the same evening. Uh, Francis Little was recaptured 50 miles away. He was brought back to the prison on July 21st, where he was put into the black hole. Um, uh, it, Francis said Little ended up uh, suffering severely, actually, from his time there in the prison. And when he finally was exchanged a couple of years later, he made his way to Curacao in the West Indies, and then I kind of lose track of him from there. Um, now, Henry Lund, William Smith, and one other man were brought back under guard from Falmouth, which was 30 miles away from Plymouth, on July 25th. I think folks here in the room know the Lunds. And uh, Henry, his younger brother Daniel, and his cousins Cutting and Richard Lund all would be eventually exchanged from the prison. And Henry went into service with John Paul Jones um, uh, in 1779. Uh, I believe his cousin did too. Yes, Cutting Lund still as third lieutenant on Bonham Richard also. So. And then Henry would go on to serve up again aboard another privateer on a new report in 1781. So must have been worth the, worth the risk. Mm -hmm. So the journal entry that Cutler provides for July 25th says specifically, Dr. Smith was the only one out of the six not brought back. So he was the only one that made it. Over the next two weeks, his Journal notes that uh, he carefully makes his way out of the country. On July 16th, there's a mention here of a Reverend Christopher Menz. He was a minister at a Presbyterian church in Plymouth. He was also known to have been converted by uh, George Whitfield, and so I think there was probably some, uh, you know, some something between the two guys that they probably both knew George Whitfield on some level. Before he died, obviously. And then this William Nancaro uh, merchant in Plymouth. Couldn't find anything about William Nancaro, but not looking So by the 20th, which is listed there, Smith is, uh, he set off to London, as he says, and he arrives there on the 22nd, noting that he calls on a Reverend Dr. Price. So Reverend Dr. Price is Richard Price of Wales. He was actually one of the most influential um, like political philosophers of his day. He supported the American Revolution, the French Revolution. Price was very connected to Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin. In fact, he had written a, uh, a political pamphlet in early 1776 that sold 180,000 copies, which is like unbelievable for the time. And they think that that pamphlet essentially is credited with helping to play a part in America declaring independence that summer. And finally, on the 27th of July, Smith makes his way to Dunkirk, as he said, which is a court in Northern Prince. Moving on, July 29th, Smith stays at somebody's named William Goods's place for a couple of days, and then lodging at Fitzgerald's. I couldn't find anything definitive about either person, but there were several innkeepers in London in 1777 named Fitzgerald. Uh, more personally, in this uh, entry here, uh, he notes that he's missed his brother Josiah by three weeks. It says, you know, Captain Cunningham had put to sea three weeks before with brother Josiah for a surgeon in the Revenge Cutter. So this fellow they're referring to here, Captain Cunningham, he was actually known to the British as the Dunkirk Pirate. He was pretty successful in, uh, you know, raids out of, out of the Dunkirk area, apparently. The ship Revenge was interesting because it had been purchased in Dunkirk by Ben Franklin uh, that spring, and it had just left port on July 17th, as noted here, for the first time. In the next two weeks, Captain Cunningham would end up capturing four ships so close to the, to the coast of England that um, it sent London insurance rates up, believe it or not, uh, and, and, and inhibited trade for a few weeks, too. 
So over the next year, the Revenge would capture 60 British vessels, that's a lot, destroying 33 of them and sending 27 into different ports as prizes. So Brother Josiah was part of that crew. I assume he probably made a little money doing that. So. And speaking of Ben Franklin, we see here that on August 4th, Samuel meets with a Mr. Nesbitt from Philadelphia. Uh, by whom I wrote to Dr. Franklin in Paris. So Jonathan Nesbitt was a merchant in Paris. He was representing his brother's company abroad, and he was one of Ben Franklin's great friends. Nesbitt became, he was one of those people that, like Nathaniel Tracy, that became impoverished by the Revolutionary War. He ultimately died broke in France at the end of the war. Franklin was, of course, in France because he was the, you know, the commissioner to France um, during the war after the Declaration of Independence, and he stayed in France until 1785. Samuel goes on to describe what he wrote to Franklin. He says, I wrote a particular account of the usage that American prisoners met with in England, and requesting the appointment of some persons to give relief to them in their unhappy and distressed situation. So, you know, Samuel had been out of prison at that point for a few weeks, and so he did not forget his fellow inmates, obviously, who were still suffering. Now, normally, if you look in the National Archives, there's a good chance you can find copies of letters to people like Ben Franklin or whoever. Now, I didn't find a copy of this letter from Samuel Smith. However, it turns out two months earlier, Smith's brother, Josiah, had the same idea. He also sent a letter to Ben Franklin, which is in the National Archives. And his letter says, I've been at liberty about three weeks, and when I left Plymouth, there were about 200 of my countrymen, which of course included his brother, Prisoners there, and as many more at Portsmouth, the former of which I frequently visited, informing them I should go to directly to France, they begged me to represent their situation to your honor. So please tell Ben Franklin about us, get us some help. So this I promise to do, as well as many other matters, which nothing but want to give me an opportunity for us not fulfilling. He makes an impassioned plea for help, noting that the ship's company, you know, after losing all their wages and adventures, were turned over to other ships and compelled to do duty though they resolutely swore they were subjects of the United States and actually begged to be sent to prison with their countrymen. Instead, they were compelled to take up arms against the United States. That's pretty rotten, I guess, right? You know, they, they were pressed into service on British ships against their own, their own countrymen. And it, he, he goes on to say, this is now Josiah, the brother, what principally astonishes our many friends here in England is that thousands of British seamen should be allowed to return to England at their pleasure to be in the King's Navy, while hundreds of Americans are actually kept in jail. So it seems like the prisoner exchange is a little one-sided, at least in this guy's opinion. And then finally, he asked specifically for assistance. He says, I've been in my country service by sea. Now remember, he had convinced the English prison board that he was just a passenger aboard that ship. Obviously not. As I am now entirely destitute in a place where I have no relations, if your honor could help me to a surgeon's berth in some cruiser, that I may support myself till I can get to America or help me in any other way, I should esteem it a great favor. So he's asking, find me a spot. I'll be a ship's surgeon again on board some <coughs> Anything just to get out of here. But back to Samuel. On August 11th, he leaves Dunkirk and he sails for Bordeaux, where he arrives on September 1st. And then the next day, he calls on and says a Mr. Delap and a Captain Clark. So the Delap brothers, I don't know which one he called on, but John and Samuel, they were French merchants and they were sympathizers of the American cause. They were known to help American ship captains actually procure armaments and powder to fit out privateers in Bordeaux. And then Captain Alexander Clark, he was a privateer captain who I realized was in Bordeaux because he had just captured a fairly large brig called the Emperor of Germany. Um, after 10 days, Smith heads for uh, Nantes, where he arrives on the 14th, he says there, St. Croix, which is a neighborhood in that area. And on the 15th, he rides to St. Nazaire at the mouth of the Loire River, where he meets with, as he says, uh, Mr. Prentice, Sergeant, and Captain Zabapson from Gloucester. So the first two folks listed there are American agents, and then the last was either William or John Babson. Both of them were brothers from Gloucester, and they were both privateer captains during the Revolutionary War. He goes upriver on the 16th, 
uh, to Penbooth, a uh, meeting with two more ship captains, including a fellow named John Adams, which of course is not the John Adams, the statesman. It's a privateer captain out of Boston who was cruising successfully out of Nance for the, the past, the previous year. And then finally, on September 17th, he goes finally upriver to Nance itself, where he meets several other captains along with, as he says, other Americans, and calls upon Jonathan Williams, the American agent at Nance. Now, Jonathan Williams, again, uh, he was a he was a uh, grand nephew of Ben Franklin, so Franklin had contacts everywhere throughout France and was always very aware of what was going on, even at kind of a minute level with some of this stuff. So, but it's interesting to think. So for eight weeks, nothing in the journal. I suppose he just stays there in the answer and tries to figure out what he's going to do. Then on November 13th, he notes the arrival of Samuel Chandler from St. Malo, which is a walled port city in Brittany. And Chandler was probably Samuel Chandler. He was um, from South Carolina. Um, and he was known to have been aboard a privateer in that area at the time. On the 21st, uh, he heads to Lorient, which is a coastal city in Brittany, meets with Mr. Clouston, this is Captain Clouston, of a Navy brig called Freedom, which is interesting. Uh, it was one of the earliest, it was a Massachusetts Navy brig, so it was a federal, <coughs> federal Navy ship. Um, it had been captured by uh, a British ship called Apollo in September, uh, September 11th, so this is a couple months later. Several of the crew were exchanged for British prisoners within a few weeks. And then Smith says he went on board the Raleigh frigate. So again, Raleigh was another one of the 13 ships authorized for the Continental Navy by the Continental Congress in 1775. So it's kind of an interesting ship. Um, it was built in Kittery, Maine, uh, the, Ra the, the Raleigh. And it was built under the supervision of what would eventually be her captain, Thomas Thompson. In 1777, Raleigh put to sea with another one of those Continental Navy ships called the Alfred. And three days later, they captured a schooner full of counterfeit Massachusetts money and burned it all. And then over the next couple of months, they captured a lot of other prizes. <clears throat> then they put it to Nance. And a few days later, it says here, December 1st, Captain Thompson, that's him, arrived from Paris to catch up with his ship, along with Captain Elisha Hinman of the Alfred. The 4th of December, Captain Adams and what he calls much more, which I assume is probably most of Adams' crew who had been aboard the Raleigh, they come on board. And then the entry on the 6th here is kind of interesting because uh, it mentions the USS Ranger. You can see there, heard of the, heard of the arrival of the Ranger at the end. And he says, with an account of Philadelphia being taken and General Burgoyne's defeat, so those are two big things, obviously, as part of the revolution, right? So the ranger had actually been dispatched to Nance to tell Ben Franklin this specific news. First was that the British General Burgoyne had lost uh, at Saratoga, he'd surrendered at Saratoga. That was a turning point in the revolution because it actually finally got France and some other foreign countries to think that the Americans had a chance to win this thing. And there's when the foreign aid starts to flow at that point, particularly from um, it would be crucial to winning war. Then they also noticed Philadelphia was taken. That was British General Howe. He occupied Philadelphia that winter, forcing Washington to retreat to Valley Forge, which of course, that's where he and his 12,000 troops had that terrible Valley Forge winter. Um, two, two big things that happened. And that's the last entry. So what happens next to Samuel Smith? Um, not a lot of information. He was a physician here in town, so there's a notice that he practiced here in Newburyport. He's sometimes listed as serving aboard a frigate called South Carolina, although I don't think it's him. I think it's another guy. The reason I think it's another guy with the same name is because they don't give him a, um, a position, so normally it would say ship surgeon or something like that. But this Samuel Smith doesn't have any position at all on the roster. I'm guessing he probably worked with and then took over the brother Josiah's practice. Remember, Josiah had also graduated at Harvard as a physician. And he was working in Newburyport by 1780. Josiah, however, we actually know a lot more about. 
This is interesting. So his brother, he was first married to a Margaret Staniford. Uh, she died two years later, essentially in childbirth. Um, he then married Dorothy Farnham in 1782. In 1787, Smith moved to Dorothy's family's estate, which was at the corner of High Street and Toppins Lane. Josiah demolished the house that was there at the time, and he built a new mansion, which he called Mount Rural, and that property had that name, Mount Rural, until the 20th century, until it was demolished, basically. Uh, by the mid-1780s, Smith had actually, Josiah Smith now, had actually given up his medical practice and become a merchant sea captain. He owned quite a few ships and became quite wealthy. <coughs> uh, he also got involved with local politics. He was, selected, uh, he was elected as a selectman for New Report in 1787. He tried to run for Congress in 1794, but didn't get anywhere with it. He served on different town committees, he served on the Court of Common Pleas, the Court of Sessions, and then here's another piece we have in our collection which will be on display uh, by May in the Bush Gallery. In 1802, after Thomas Jefferson was elected, um, Josiah Smith was appointed as a, uh, a Massachusetts Commissioner of the Bankruptcy Court, which is what this piece of paper, as you can see, probably the top Josiah Smith's name up there, but you can see Thomas Jefferson's. <laughs> You know, very bold signature there at the bottom. And it's a two for it because you have James Madison's signature there as Secretary of State. So. <laughs> uh, Josiah would, you know, also be a member of the committees that welcomed James Madison to Newport in 1817. He was a member of the committee that when Marquis de Lafayette came here in 1824, so he was very involved with both politics. And then finally, two brothers. Samuel Smith dies in Newbury Court on December 5th, 1827, and his brother dies, Josiah, the next year on September 9th. That's the end of the Smith boys. <laughs> <laughs> now I can try and take some questions. Yes? Yeah. I'm wondering, anywhere in his journal entries, does he talk about the nitty gritty of being a doctor? Not a thing. That, what you saw was, that is every entry in that journal. Wow. wow. That's it. Yeah. It must be hard to research Smith's. Oh yeah, well Smith. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Although there's actually a lot of decent material, like National Archives. There's like a there's like a National um, Naval American Revolutionary database. There's, there's a lot of there's a lot of good material in attracting people like. Especially the privateers. Yes. Kevin, you mentioned the term agent. Were those <coughs> federal government employees? No, they were agents of like merc mercantile houses, okay. essentially. That's what they were, sure. Yeah. So I mean, you know, a lot of these guys were still doing business during the Revolutionary War. I mean, they were still doing it captured, obviously, but they still had you know, they still had mercantile houses <coughs> in Europe in the different European countries, maybe not England, but you know, France, Germany, places like that. Nathaniel Tracy, for example, everybody's sort of familiar with him, I think. But anyway, he you know, he was he was a fellow that was very wealthy in town here as a merchant. He outfitted a lot of privateers. He lost a ton of money, unfortunately. He actually went bankrupt. One of the reasons he went bankrupt is, you know, after the revolution he went to try and collect, you know, debts owed to him by a lot of these companies overseas, and they were like, oh well. So that was, you know, one of the I mean, especially, again, he did a lot of business with France, and France at the time was, you know, not only did they back the United States, you know, with money, they had foreign aid, and then they went through the own revolution, obviously. Yes, yes, in the back, yes. Um, you talk about the um, the um, Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Took their clothes. Is that like extra clothes, or would they, nope. would they do that purposely? So it, was they, it was their actual clothes, yeah. And then would they give them back to them? Not necessarily. So then, if they escape, they. So when they were in the prison, they probably had something to wear. Yeah, but remember, they were on a prison ship for six months, just sort of stuck in the middle of one of the rivers there. Yeah. Yes. How important was privateering in the success of the revolution? So, 
individual privateers, it's tough to say. I mean, uh, well, you, you, so we talked about the vengeance, that was one of them, and um, what was the other one? The, uh, the uh, revenge cutter. So the revenge captain, 60 ships, I mean, that's going to put a dent in anything, right? You capture 60 British vessels, that's going to that's do something. So, yeah, the privateers, I mean, they were in it for the money, too, but yeah, they, they had, they, I don't know that they had an outsized influence on how things happened. I mean, there was a lot of naval warfare, but I mean, the Revolutionary War was uh, you know, on land. Uh, the big battles were on land still. Yes? Well, we, at the time period, as I understand it, we didn't have a real industrial base to, to uh, create armaments. And that to create, I'm sorry, what was that? Armaments. Okay. Uh, and a lot of the animals came from far here. Is that true or not? So, an industrial base. Um, you know, this was a shipbuilding community for the for the for the British Crown initially, and then when things turned over, there were a lot of privateers built here because we were a shipbuilding community. So. In terms of importance, Newbury Port had a lot of, you know, influence on the numbers of ships and privateers in the matter here. In terms of an industrial base, but yeah, I mean, well, you can see there was a story there that there was somebody uh, they they captured a ship that had a schooner that had you know tons of counterfeit Massachusetts currency. You know. That was that was part of the British effort too to try and devalue. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Were you able to get a sense of what the family lives were like with these guys? No, I mean Smith. I mean Samuel Smith. I don't really know anything about it except when he was a kid. I mean, that, you know, his family life. You get a, an idea that he grew up wealthy, obviously, in, in Ipswich, and he went to Harvard. And, but here in town, not a lot of info. Josiah Smith. Yeah, I mean, you you know, he was married for two years. The wife died a couple months after giving birth, and the baby died at the same time. And, he got married again, and I know, he, you know, he gave up medicine basically, right? I mean, he was trained the same as his brother to be a, a physician, and he made better money as a merchant, so he went with that. Yes? Did you say that Ben Franklin had a, a, a privateer? Did he own? So Ben Franklin would help to acquire the privateers, like, so he's in France, right? And so he helped acquire the cutter that Josiah Smith sailed on. So in Dunkirk, Franklin would have used, you know, essentially American money or borrowed French money or whatever to acquire a ship that then would be fitted out as a privateer. I mean, that makes sense, right? Because like that Pacific um, ship, they had uh, Cunningham was what they call him Dunkirk pilot, pirate. So he was back and forth. I mean, right there on the coast of England. So he's. You know, it makes a lot of sense to just kind of go back and forth that way and capture whatever you can. Yes? This is maybe stupid. When the Brits took the American ship, they stripped down the sailors, took their clothing. What did we do to the British ship? So not, I, I wouldn't say that was like probably all the time, right? Problem. I mean, it was... What did with the American ships do to the British? Did they take their boats and loot them? Would they do no, Jen, I mean, I... I don't know. I mean, I'm sure I could probably find examples that they did, but you know, generally for the American ships, it was the, the the best course of action would be if they could get it back into a port somewhere and get paid, right? To get half the value of it. Release all the sailors. Well, they'd go to prison, and then there'd be prisoner exchanges. So that would that's what these two letters to Ben Franklin, one from Smith Samuel Smith, and one from his brother, both asking Franklin, you know. There's, well, Josiah says there's at least 200 guys in Plymouth and at least 200 more in Portsmouth in England. And, you know, can somebody do something about trading for these guys? And, and he makes the point, too, that he thought the trades weren't fair, right? That was in there, too. He, he's like, people are astonished how we keep sending British sailors back to serve the king. And meanwhile, our guys are sitting in British prison. Anything else? Yes? Uh, is 
so much interesting information. Is there somewhere where your lecture is in print? In print? Um, <laughs> I could put my notes somewhere, yes. And I know that they're, they're videoing this, so you could always go listen to me again if you're so inclined. <laughs> Not that you would be, but... <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I can provide the notes for this somewhere. I'll figure it out with James. Okay, we'll put it, when we put the video on YouTube, we'll put a note on YouTube where to find this. Okay, okay. Because it was so interesting, I've been thinking about what you just said, and that is what you said. Oh. Yeah, I mean, it's not, like I say, it's not a ton of info directly in his journal. I mean, he's got entries like escape mill prison, and you're like, oh, okay, you know, but you, you gotta kind of dig into it a little, and, you know, realize you get out with six other guys, you know, where made it, you know, where did he go after that, you know, that kind of thing. Any other questions? All right, thanks, and make sure to see you.